Good morning. We begin this morning with general questions. Our first question is from Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how its resilience fund to reduce the risk of ferries breaking down has been spent. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Since the announcement of the fund in August 2018, this has been used in 23 individual resilience projects across the fleet of vessels that are deployed to provide the Clyde and Hebrides services. This investment should, based on information presented to us, result in a significant improvement to fleet resilience this year. The projects range from upgrades to the full propulsion and bow thruster controls on four vessels to a replacement water mist firefighting pump on another vessel. Further upgrades are planned to further reduce the risk of technical failures impacting on service re reliability. Alistair Allen. I thank the Minister for his reply. As he will be aware, ferry services to the Isle of Barra suffered serious disruption last week due to uh, technical problems affecting the MV Isle of Lewis, leaving the community there uh, without a mainland link for far too long. What lessons can be learned from this incident, particularly in terms of making sure communities are less re reliant on either replacement parts or engineers having to be flown in? Minister. I, I certainly recognise the key role ferry services play in supporting island remote mainland communities such as uh, those uh, that uh, Dr Allen represents and I appreciate the disruption experienced on the MV uh, Isle of Lewis uh, was recently removed uh, when it was recently moved from the Oban to Barra service for a 3D period uh, due to a problem with the bow thruster exhaust system uh, and the connection to the hull. I'm pleased to say while it's back in, in service, uh, Calmac Ferries are working, currently working with Caledonian uh, Maritime Assets Limited uh, or CMAL to assess the scope of works carried out at a future dry docking to make sure that it can be proactively tackled the next time the vessel's in dry dock. And this may widen the scope for more preventative measures to be carried out in the future. So we're obviously looking at measures such as this to ensure that it doesn't repeat elsewhere in the fleet. Uh, but uh, uh, the member is absolutely right that looking at uh, initiatives such as uh, purchasing of spare parts, which has been done, also the, um, uh, uh, the operator has been involved in commissioning uh, the production of what are, are thought to be um, uh, obsolete parts to make sure that they're in place for the replacement vessel, given that these vessels were sometimes uh, built many years ago and parts are no longer available on the market. So we're very hard to ensure the availability of parts to ensure that most commonly uh, likely to fail parts on the vessels are able to be replaced quickly and return the vessels quickly to service. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, President. Also, I share much sympathy with Mr. Allen's question. It seems to be Groundhog Day with so many vessels coming offline. Minister, is there anything to do with the fact that half of Carmack's fleet are beyond their 25-year life expectancy, given that the two newest ferry ferries that are due to be entered into the fleet are already over a year late? Does the Minister not agree with me that the status quo is simply unacceptable and is letting island communities down every day right across Scotland? Minister. Um, the first thing I'll do is accept that clearly the delays to the two vessels, 801 and 802, is, is greatly disappointing. That's a matter of record. I've put that on record myself. And clearly we are concerned to make sure those vessels are delivered and we can introduce them to the fleet to provide more capacity, which will help enormously with the, without the need to cascade vessels across uh, routes across, across the Clyde and Hebrides. So that's clearly an objective we, we all share, I'm sure. But what I would challenge in, in Mr Green's statement is assertion that that the community is being let down, what he would appear to be suggesting on a routine basis. Now, I acknowledge there have been difficulties, uh, and Mr. Green can complain from a sedentary position, but I'm trying to respond to his question. The, the CalMac, let's not forget, has a very good record otherwise. We, we have uh, high levels of customer satisfaction, despite the issues which I acknowledge have happened in the last year and are not satisfactory, and we need to address them. I'm not running away from that issue. But let's not uh, detract from the fact that, generally speaking, CalMac delivers a good service to its communities. It's recognised a lifeline service. The staff work very hard on behalf of the communities they serve. And I think uh, I would just ask Mr Green to reflect on the tone of his question. But I do accept there are issues to be redressed. And Rhoda Grant. <coughs> just further to the reply from the Minister when he talked about cascading ferries um, through the different um, routes. What is the case at the moment is that the new Loch Seaforth can only use three ports. My understanding is that two new ferries in order will need substantial changes to the ports they use. So it's impossible to cascade new ferries around different routes. Surely the Scottish Government and Transport Scotland should be looking at a way to make sure that ferries can fit any port so that they can be used in such circumstances. Minister. Uh, well, actually, at the, the heart of um, Rhoda Grant's point, there is a, a genuine point that she's, she's raising there, which uh, we acknowledge. Clearly, historically, vessels have been designed for specific routes and perhaps not enough thought put into how they could be interchangeable across the network. 
Clearly, there are some local conditions, which in terms of the depth of water, in terms of the harbour approaches, and indeed the, the orientation of the berths, which are, are limiting factors in the use of vessels, and not least uh, larger vessels cannot navigate in, in tightly confined spaces, as I'm sure the member would acknowledge. But we are taking that forward in terms of how we look at the vessel replacement and deployment plan, how we can work with CalMAC and CMAL to try and develop uh, uh, greater resilience designed in from the start in terms of the interchangeability of vessels across the network. That cannot be done overnight, of course, I'm sure Rhoda Grant would acknowledge that, but it's certainly something we recognise and we'll try and address. Uh, but the, the vessels themselves are, uh, the Loch Seaforth is actually one of the most reliable vessels we have. It's, it's a, a very reliable vessel and had one incident of note so far and, and I hope that would be something that Rhoda Grant would accept. Question number two, Angus Macdonald. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed the proposed growth deal for Falkirk District with the Secretary of State for Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I last discussed the Falkirk growth deal with the Secretary of State for Scotland on the 8th of March at the signing of the heads of term for the Ayrshire growth deal in Ayr. I encouraged the Secretary of State to visit the Falkirk area and to commit to a deal for Falkirk as soon as possible. The Secretary of State visited Falkirk and met with a number of partners involved in the Falkirk deal proposal on the 17th of April. However, regrettably, the UK Government has yet to formally commit to a deal. Angus MacDonald. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I'm, I'm aware that the Leader of the Council uh, in Falkirk, along with other members of the local economic partnership, met with the Secretary of State last week uh, and impressed upon him that any future growth deal for Falkirk District would not just be a local deal, but also a national deal, given the significant contribution Grangemouth makes to the Scottish economy. Given that the gross value added in the Falkirk area in 2018 was £3.3 billion, which was 2% of total national output, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that, given Falkirk District's large manufacturing sector is forecast to be a key contributor to future economic growth, there is no time to waste in setting up a Falkirk growth deal, and sooner rather than later? Uh, President Officer, I do agree with the member. There is a need for us to press ahead with a Falkirk growth deal, given the very significant contribution it makes, not just to the regional economy, but to the national economy um, of Scotland. And I will continue to press the UK Government to commit to a Falkirk growth deal and will, of course, continue to highlight what I believe is the huge potential uh, benefits of a growth deal to the Falkirk area and beyond when I next meet with the Secretary of State. Um, as a member will be aware, the Scottish Government has a very clear uh, commitment to achieving 100% coverage uh, of Scotland with growth deals, which will deliver real benefit to local communities in the form of new jobs and uh, uh, wider economic opportunities that will drive. And I'll certainly continue to press the UK Government to match our commitment to ensuring that we have 100% coverage of uh, growth deals, including within the Falkirk Council area. Question number three, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Highlands and Islands Airports Limited regarding the incident on 5th April 2019 when a plane left Kirkwall Airport without air traffic control clearance. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Logan Air and High Isle advised us that uh, an aircraft left Kirkwall on the 5th of April without ATC services uh, which uh, being provided, uh, even though the request to start the engines was made before the airport closed. Uh, to avoid inconveniencing passengers, a decision was made by Logan Air and the captain in agreement with High Isle Management to depart without ATC provision, but that the airport fire service was in attendance, having satisfied themselves that it was safe to do so. The flight operated normally with ATC cover uh, after departing Kirkwall. Operating at airports without ATC cover is not uncommon for Logan Air's pilots, but it is uncommon at Kirkwall, which is why Logan Air notified the Civil Aviation Authority. Rhoda Grant. It's extremely concerning that this flight left Kirkwall without air traffic control cover. And if the argument is that, that that caused no danger, it begs the question, why does the Civil Aviation Authority demand air traffic control presence at all? Can the Cabinet Secretary give me an assurance today that this will never happen again and that people will not be put at risk in this way? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign Officer, um, uh, ATC cover at Kirkwall Airport is not part of its licensing uh, provision. Uh, fire cover is part of its licensing con uh, con provisions. 
uh, in order to comply with Civil Aviation Authority regulations. Uh, the member will recognise that there is actually a standard set of regulations for uh, undertaking a flight of this nature uh, where ATC cover is not required. And on this occasion, uh, HIAL and Logan Air have gone through that procedure and applied it uh, in this particular flight and have reported it as they are due to do uh, to the Civil Aviation Authority to consider that they have applied all the appropriate regulations for dealing with these matters. Question number four, Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports research into and the treatment of endometriosis. Minister Claire Hockey. The Scottish Government's Chief Scientist, Scientist Office, CSO, is providing £162,000 for a preliminary study on laparoscopic treatment of endometriosis. This is to pave the way for a larger study into the safety and effectiveness of the treatment. CSO also contributes financially to UK-wide research programmes run by the National Institute for Health Research, enabling researchers in Scotland to apply to those programmes. A £1.7 million NIHR-funded study led from Scotland is looking at a hormone treatment to prevent recurrence of endometriosis. Three specialist endometriosis treatment centres have been established in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Glasgow, with the Glasgow Treatment Centre opening this month. Angela Constance. Uh, thank you. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. Um, I wonder if the Minister would commit to working with uh, Endo Warriors, West Lothian in my constituency, uh, and indeed others, uh, to develop a Scottish National Action Plan and a database for endometriosis care, thus providing a, a platform for improving further awareness and understanding, and actually, crucially, uh, treatment of and research uh, into endometriosis uh, particularly given that one in ten women suffer from this debilitating condition uh, and those that have associated chronic pelvic pain. Thank you. Minister. The introduction of three specialist endometriosis centres across Scotland came about as a result of a review set up by the Chief Medical Officer. The three centres in Scotland will go some way in raising awareness amongst the public and importantly among healthcare professionals. They will ensure that women living with endometriosis have access to speedy diagnostics and the best treatment available. Further to this, we are already considering the needs of women and girls with pelvic pain as part of the Scottish Access Collaborative Gynaecological Group, which is identifying a number of improvement opportunities, including improved access to information for patients to self-manage, easier access to nationally recommended guidelines and pathways for GPs, and support for primary care cluster groups to develop expertise in women's health. In terms of working with Endo Warriors, we have been in dialogue with them about developing educational resources about menstrual health for schools. Education Scotland has offered to review, review these resources and consider this for inclusion in the National Improvement Hub, which all schools can access and distribute to pupils. And both founders of Endo Warriors, West Lothian, Candice McKenzie and Claire Beattie are to be congratulated on the work that they are doing in this area. Monica Lennon. Presiding officer, endometriosis can have a detrimental impact on mental health, which the minister touched on. Can the minister advise what psychological support services are available to women with endometriosis and how much funding is available for this support? Minister. So there are uh, various uh, toolkits being developed um, uh, following the NICE guidelines um, uh, that were uh, launched in um, the UK, um, as well as other educational resources, including e-learning. Uh, with regards to specific psychological um, support, I would be happy to come back to the member with that information. Question number five, Anas Sarwar. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to prevent hospital-acquired infections. Minister Claire Hockey. Scotland has made significant progress in tackling healthcare-associated infections. Since 2007, Scotland has seen significant reductions in infections, such as C. difficile, which is partly due to improved use of antibiotics in hospitals and community settings. But not all HCAIs are preventable. However, our National Infection Prevention and Control Manual makes it easy for our frontline healthcare staff to apply effective infection prevention and control practice. The NIPCM ensures that the assessment and escalation of infection, outbreaks and incidents is far more robust. Our well-established national infection surveillance system provides NHS boards with rich intelligence which can be used to target quality improvement interventions and improve patient safety. 
and the Scottish Patient Safety Programme has truly become a national safety movement which attracts interest from all over the world and since 2012 Scotland has seen a 21% reduction in sepsis mortality rates. And that's our. The Minister will be aware of the tragic deaths associated with the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Will she take this opportunity to express our condolences to all the families impacted by those tragic events? Can she update the Parliament on the progress with the independent inquiry into the structural issues at the Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital? Uh, can she tell us what her view is on the Health Board now considering legal action against those that designed and built the hospital? And what reassurance can she give to patients and their families that they will be safe going into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital? Minister. Um, of course, our thoughts are with the families that are affected at this time, and I think um, that would be something that could be echoed across the chamber. And the board is taking all the necessary steps to manage this incident and ensure patient safety. Um, the, uh, Mr. Sarwa will be aware that the Cabinet Secretary for Health updated Parliament on the 26th of February and announced that she'd commissioned an independent review. Dr. Andrew Fraser, Director of Public Health Science, NHS Scotland, and Dr. Brian Montgomery, and former NHS Medical Director and Interim Chief Executive, have agreed to act as co-chairs of the independent review. In order to ensure appropriate membership of the review committee, the independent chairs of the review, Drs. Brian Montgomery and Andrew Fraser, have been taking advice from experts on who will be best able to contribute to the review, as well as analysing and reflecting on the work that has been done to date. And from this, they will determine the precise remit of the review and the resources and support that they will require. And I expect that the independent chairs will be able to consult on a draft shortly. Question number six, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that freight capacity on Northern Isles ferry routes uh, meets future demand. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the next Northern Isles contract will provide flexibility to allow for additional sailings and vessels to be made available to meet demand. Transport Scotland regularly discusses freight services with haulage and aquaculture sectors through established forums and this close engagement will continue and we will review all mitigation options including flexing timetables as and when appropriate, being mindful of the prevailing resource pressures. Options for this year are being considered and we will analyse all evidence and liaise with the operator to ensure there is sufficient freight capacity to service the Northern Isles. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you. Last September, uh, the First Minister assured me the Government was committed to addressing the growing demand for additional freight capacity on the Northern Isle ferry routes to meet the needs of key sectors of the Orkney and Shetland economies. Through freedom of information, we now know that CMAL proposed to purchase a long-term charter of the Clipper Ranger to meet that need, operating for four to five months on the Northern Isles routes, two months on Ullapool Stornoway, and also provided much needed dry dock cover and resilience on the Northern Isle services. Can the Minister explain to my constituents why no action appears to have been taken in response to that very sensible proposal, or to deliver on the assurance that Nicola Sturgeon gave me in this chamber last September? Absolutely. Minister. Mr MacArthur um, should acknowledge that we provided additional freight capacity last autumn to help with the yeah. agriculture sector movements and we worked with local stakeholders to do that. So uh, I think just the outset, just to present that the, uh, the, the Scottish Government and our agencies are not providing help is inaccurate. But what we did look very closely at the Clipper Ranger and uh, Mr MacArthur may have access to the Freedom Information uh, information. Not all of the commercially sensitive information is in that document for understandable reasons I'm sure he'll appreciate. But we looked very closely at it. It did not represent a, a proper a value for money a, a transaction for the Scottish Government on that basis that uh, we could only really operate on the Ullapool to Stornoway route and indeed the Northern Isles, which I appreciate would help those communities, but didn't represent a good value for money in that respect. But we keep our options open. We're continuing to look for vessels which could supplement the fleet and uh, happy to meet Mr MacArthur and indeed Mr Scott, I know his interest in this issue as well, uh, to discuss what further action we can take. And Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you. With the Scottish Government's promise to reduce ferry fares on the Northern Isles route still tied up in legal action, leaving the islands facing yet another summer season without this long-standing issue resolved, can I ask the Minister if he has spoken or will speak with Government colleagues about whether the funding set aside to reduce fares, which cannot be used at the moment, could be deployed elsewhere to promote tourism on the islands, particularly to encourage out-of-season visitors? Minister. Well, clearly, clearly, I recognise the interest I've, I've engaged with Councillor Stockin for Orkney Islands Council on a number of occasions to discuss this very issue that Mr Halker Johnson raises today. Um, we are, while we are sympathetic to obviously the importance of ferries for developing the tourism economy of the Orkney Islands and indeed for the Shetland Island communities as well, uh, and we're 
obviously looking at very closely at what we can do to augment services where we can do so. We have to live very carefully within state's consideration. Mr Halker Johnson has rightly referenced the judicial review of uh, the, the uh, position in regards to Pentland Ferry's case against Scottish ministers, so I can't comment on that. But uh, what I will give an undertaking that we have committed to RET and, and, and we will deliver that if we're able to do so. Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions.